org slash cities tour. Each week, American History TV's Real America brings you archival films that help tell the story of the 20th century. CBS reports Watts, Riot or Revolt, originally broadcast on December 7, 1965, documents the events of August 11 through August 17, 1965, when widespread looting, arson and violence in Los Angeles resulted in 34 deaths, over 1,000 injuries, over 3,000 arrests, and the involvement of several thousand California Army National Guardsmen. The hour-long CBS News program investigates the many reasons behind the events in Watts, often citing a report commissioned by Governor Pat Brown, which concludes that high unemployment, poor schools, poor living conditions, and police abuses were the root causes of community unrest. You can lift them higher than that, friend. Let's get them up there. The first one drops her hand, dead man. Absolutely incredible scene. The gun battle in the middle of Broadway. The main business streets of Los Angeles. Small army of policemen, most of them carrying shotguns. National Guardsmen riding jeeps with 30 caliber machine guns. Bodies of several Negroes who have been shot already in this battle, stretched out beside the curb. Acres and acres of broken glass, burned, gutted, and looted stores and offices. And now, this hunt, like something out of a bad war movie. A western, perhaps. Policemen on the rooftops, in the streets. They think now they've found the man they're after. That was part of the Civil War fought on the streets of Los Angeles one night this summer. Violence set off, according to some of the participants, by a history of ancient law. I think it started 400 years ago. And things just kept building up, building up. And heat, one thing, and uh, poverty. People getting tired of being pushed around by you white people, that's all. You couldn't talk to anybody, so there was nobody to talk to. You couldn't talk to the cops because they didn't want to talk to me, they wanted to beat my brains up. Mm -hmm. Just like they've been doing all the time. And the only way, the only way it seems that we can ever get anybody at any time to listen to us is to start a riot. We got sense enough to know that this is not the final answer. Mm -hmm. Right at the Thank beginning. You. Governor, I hand you the report that has been prepared by your commission. Uh, we cannot, uh, Governor, uh, tell you any one particular reason why the riots took place in August and why they took place in Los Angeles. Tonight, CBS Reports examines the question of Watts. Was it a local riot or the beginning of a national revolt? What started it? What stopped it? Will there be another Watts? John McCone has just presented Governor Edmund Brown of California his investigating committee's report seeking the answers to just such questions. These findings are an integral part of what follows a CBS report study of the principal events and causes of the nightmare in Watts. International Business Machines, IBM presents CBS Reports. Watts, Riot or Revolt? Now, here is CBS News correspondent Bill Stout, who has covered the Watt story from the moment the rioting began. Three months ago, on this street in Los Angeles, California, violence produced all this. A local riot or a revolt? Part of a national social revolution? A carnival of hoodlum lawlessness? Or the product of a festering social illness? And most puzzling of all, if it was a riot, why did it happen here? in the community thought to be least caught up in racial tensions. A Frenchman who looked at his own country's revolution 175 years ago left us with a comment which may give some insight. He said, the evils which can be endured with patience as long as they are inevitable seem intolerable as soon as a hope can be entertained of escaping them. 
In the past 25 years, more than 300,000 Negroes from other parts of the United States have come to Los Angeles in the hope of escaping evils they had endured with patience. But on the night of Wednesday, August the 11th, that patience ran out. It was the most widespread, most destructive racial violence in American history. White people driving through the riot area were considered fair game, whether young or old, men or women. Their cars were battered, the drivers stoned, kicked and beaten, and the cars were burned. The mobs might groan and curse in disappointment when a white got away, and then cheer like a football crowd when a car went up in flames. Okay. The burning and looting, the shooting and beating went on for nearly a week. Thirty-four persons were killed, all but five of them Negroes. More than 1,000 persons injured or wounded. More than 200 business places destroyed by fire. 700 more smashed, looted, and damaged. Negro merchants sought to protect themselves with hurriedly scrawled appeals. The cost in dollars, even now, is hard to estimate. Perhaps 50 million, 60 million, or more. Nearly 4,000 persons arrested. Shut it up and get out of that car with your hands up. All of you, the one in the back seat, too. Come on, get up. Get your hands up, I said. Drop that purse and get your hands up. Get your hands up. Get up. Get your hands up. Let's go. Come on. Right this way. Negro leaders blamed it on a variety of social elements. Poverty and unemployment, poor schools and bad housing, all of which add up to discrimination. But most of all, said the Negro spokesman, police brutality. And the mobs agreed. But the police were not the only targets. Firemen rushing about the city trying to control dozens of blazes at once were showered with rocks and bottles and sometimes found themselves under heavy gunfire. Control 12, calling staff reach. The mobs hated authority, but more generally, they hated all whites. And before the mobs finished, before they spent themselves, by the time the rioting had run its course, the police had been forced to plot their action over 54 square miles in the middle of the nation's third largest city. 54 square miles more than twice the size of the entire island of Manhattan. Indeed, Harlem or South Chicago, where steaming, rat-ridden tenements are the raw material of riot, seemed the most likely to produce those northern explosions that were predicted in white America's anxiety over the Negro Revolution. No one expected the flashpoint of discontent to be in the sprawling, bungalowed 450 square miles of Los Angeles. Yet it did happen there in an area holding one-sixth of the county's 523,000 Negroes. Watts is a ghetto, but not a slum, as the term is known in older cities. There are streets of trim, lower-middle-class homes, and there are squalid areas of condemned houses with people living in them. Two-thirds of the adults have less than a high school education. One in eight is illiterate. Of every 10 homes, nine were built before 1939. One in five is deteriorated. Watts has the lowest average income rate in Los Angeles County, $4,000 per year, compared with more than $8,000 per year for the white community. Almost 60% of the Watts families receive some sort of welfare against an unemployment rate that holds around 30%. One of every three teenagers comes from a broken home. The school dropout rate is more than twice that of the city overall. Most residents are newcomers who joined the modern gold rush to California of the past 25 years. Many are newcomers from the most backward parts of the Deep South, poor and ignorant Negroes who have no skills to offer a big city employer, no desire for classroom learning. 
not even the knowledge of how to live in urban surroundings, often not even the knowledge of how to use plumbing. They crowd together, these backcountry refugees, a thousand new ones every month pouring into Los Angeles. And they find in the land of golden promise that there still are white lawmen, white merchants, white landlords. It began as many race riots have begun with the arrest of a Negro by white officers, right here at this corner. In this case, two young Negroes were stopped by California Highway Patrolmen and charged with drunk driving. There was a scuffle and a crowd gathered. The mother of the two, they are brothers, joined in, and she and another woman the crowd thought was pregnant were pushed and shoved. The highway patrolmen were on the scene 40 minutes, a period some suggested was overlong in the face of a gathering hostile crowd. The McCone Commission dug thoroughly into this event. It found no basis for criticizing the conduct or judgment of officers on the scene. But no one questions this was the incident, nothing more, the spark that lighted the fuse. In the background is a long chronicle of defeat and disappointment, of discrimination and Negro grievances, of pure hate for the white man. There was, for instance, in the spring of 1962, a gun battle between Negroes and police outside the Los Angeles Mosque of the Muslims, a sect built around the belief that all whites are evil, that complete separation of the races is the only hope for America. In that gunfight, one Negro was killed, 14 wounded. Some Los Angeles citizens believe the Muslim shooting so crystallized Negro feelings that from that point, April 1962, big trouble was inevitable. There were other humiliations, distantly noted by whites, but resounding in Watts like a slap in the face. Negro Catholics prayed as the head of the Catholic Archdiocese, James Francis Cardinal McIntyre, declaring Negroes to be better treated in Los Angeles than anywhere in the United States, laid down for his clergy the line that racial problems were to be treated as political rather than moral issues. A young priest, Father William H. Dubay, challenged the cardinal, insisting race discrimination is immoral and therefore a direct concern of the church. Negroes watched while the clergyman dispatched a rebellious and futile appeal to the Pope in Rome. All of us concerned with giving our Negro congregation positive leadership in their yearning for full protection under the law, equal opportunities for education, jobs, and housing, cannot reconcile the clear teachings of Christ and the church with the restrictive and nullifying policies of the Cardinal. I urge you, therefore, to remove Cardinal McIntyre from office. Negroes watched, too, through the long political campaign of 1964, when the major issue in California, bigger even than the Johnson-Goldwater contest, was fair housing. State law requiring the sale of homes to any person able to pay, regardless of color, was under attack. White organizations, led by various real estate groups, collected signatures for a referendum which would repeal the law. Martin Luther King came to Watts to spell out the meaning of the referendum battle, but the great majority of California voters rejected law-enforced non-discrimination in housing, the majority telling the Negroes to stay put. The McCone report cites that vote as a major factor adding to Negro resentment. And there were other factors, too. You might have a TV, they can see the nice things in other parts of the city, and, and uh, they're tired, they're hungry. They are more educated. They know what's going on in the world. They see millions and billions of dollars spent on rockets and the first one thing that I sent overseas to other countries. And here in their own country, you know, they're hungry, they're out of job. Finally, there was haggling over the poverty program. Indeed, the very day the riots began, this was the headline in the Los Angeles Times. In Harlem this past summer, poverty funds were used to give jobs and money to thousands of young Negroes. But in Los Angeles, not one cent was put into the poverty area. Despite all these aggravations and evidence of white indifference, Los Angeles' long history of freedom from racial strife, plus the fact that it had weathered the troubled summer of 1964 without difficulty, had created a false sense of well-being, so that when the violence did erupt, its impact seemed many times magnified. Indeed, the supposed lessons of peaceful Los Angeles had been cited proudly to lawmen around the country by its chief of police, 
a man known for his integrity and the bluntness of his opinions. Thus, after the first night of violence, embarrassed perhaps and understandably edgy, Chief William H. Parker faced newsmen. What do you want the policemen to do? Do you want to mask them in there for what purpose? Are pinning everybody down or, or what? No, I'm simply asking you to explain what, what the thinking of the police is. I have no... Well, the thing is, the police said they have a city to protect. And they can't send all the men in to watch and allow all these, the rest of the 450 square miles to be open season to every, every petty criminal and burglar in town. So this is the answer to the question. Someone like Dr. Martin Luther King should be down there? No, no King doesn't. Uh, we've got local residents here. King doesn't put out all the fires in the United <laughs> States. There are some local Negroes here that are, le that ha are leaders in these situations. <laughs> now, uh, we would assume that they have some influence on them or they wouldn't be representing them. Now, those individuals are certainly in a position to go down there and talk to these people and tell them that this is inordinate and they shouldn't continue it. Let that Thursday point afternoon, point one of those leaders Parker referred to, the Reverend H. H. Brookins, with other ministers and politicians, black and white, called a peace meeting at a neighborhood playground. And I submit to you that we shall not see a Harlem or Rochester or a New York. We can solve it. It is yet time. But Brookins and the others learned they themselves did not understand their people, did not know the intensity of their rage, and could not plumb the depth of their hate. Because I was on Avalon last night. See, and I'm going to tell you something. Tonight is going to be another one, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, no, no, wait, wait. Listen, listen. See, they, we, uh, we, the Negro people down here have gotten completely fed up. And you know what they're going to do tonight? They don't care. They're not, they not going they to fight down here no more. You know where they're going? They're after the white people. Now they're after the white people. They're going to congregate. They're going to caravan out in Inglewood, Clear Del Rey, and everywhere else the white man is going to stay. They're going to do the white man is tonight. And I'm going to... Come on, come on, come on, come on. Here is the seed of its own destruction. And that if for us to consent, continue to try and meet violence with violence okay. is the wrong way, that's all. It's pure and simple. I believe that while we talk about people staying off the street, every citizen's right is to walk the street, but if he must walk it in dignity and respect. I believe, on the other hand, that there ought not to be any concentration of police power in this community tonight. After that meeting, Brookins and John Buggs of the County Human Relations Commission, a group with a record of success in dealing with racial troubles, took their recommendation that there be less obvious policing of the area Thursday night to Deputy Police Chief Roger Murdoch. The police department indicated to us that they were going to run the city their own way and they would prove who runs the city of Los Angeles. Uh, Mr. Roger Murdoch's attitude was one, I would suspect, from a Jim Clark in Alabama. We are not in Alabama. We want to work with the police. We want to work with elected officials, not against them. When we returned to 118th Street after having talked with Mr. Roger Murdoch of the 7th to 7th Division, we had to report what we found. It was like lighting a fuse. Uh, they immediately said, well, all right, we told you that your leadership didn't amount to much. You see what they think about you. So now let us do it our own way. At this time, about uh, six police cars moved in, blowing sirens with about 500 people lining the streets. And it was just like an explosion, Bill. Everything just went haywire. The frustration of the Reverend Brookins and his associates goes far toward explaining the why of Watts as well as the how. Actually, from the quarrel over the performance of Negro leadership was beginning to emerge one of the great unpalatable truths of the riot that there were and are groups in the Negro community for whom nobody spoke. Most of the Negroes who hold elective office in Los Angeles stayed out of the area. But State Assemblyman Mervyn Dimely, a resident of the riot area, was there constantly. And he spoke the truth no one wanted to hear. Shall I relate to you an incident? About 4 o'clock Thursday, Friday morning, I went up to a group that was throwing bottles. And I said, listen, baby, let's cool it. And I says, man, where are you from, Baldwin Hills? I said, no, man, I live on Avalon. He said, well, you must be living in some big house. And I said, no, man, I'm with the people. He says, well, if, you, if you're with us, here, throw it. And he handed me the bottle. And I says, man, I'm for peace. He says, man, you're not for peace. You're with the man. The man, in this case, is the white man or the, or the police. 
And he says, look, man, we don't want to hear you. We don't want to hear Dr. Martin Luther King. We don't want to hear Dick Gregory. We don't want to hear uh, Brookings. We just want to talk with the men ourselves. Although the absence of effective Negro leadership was striking, the grasp of affairs by white officials, aside from Chief Parker, was also less than distinguished. As word of the shouted threat to do the white man in spread by word of mouth from the playground peace meeting, whites began to crowd the gun shops for weapons to defend themselves. The governor of California was in Greece, vacationing. The mayor of Los Angeles had found it necessary to keep a speaking engagement in San Diego Thursday. He flew to another such date in San Francisco after a Friday morning conference with Parker at which it was decided to call the guard if the riot worsened. Uh, the Commonwealth Club has advertised this speech for a long time. They have hundreds of reservations. And uh, so, of course, there isn't anything more especially that I could do in the next few hours. But uh, I'll go up and right back to keep my commitment. But if it hadn't been made for months, I certainly wouldn't go. The McCone Report does not criticize Mayor Yorty. It simply quotes, without comment, the reason he gave for his absence from the city. As Mayor Yorty left for his luncheon date in San Francisco, Chief Parker, the man in charge and the man on the spot from the beginning, now had hard words for the peacemakers he had earlier encouraged. And I'm not going to play games with, with well-meaning people who lack expertise. The difficulty is that the people who are getting hurt here are the police and innocent citizens, and the rioters are prevailing. The chief's concern deepened early Friday when the character of the rioting changed. The note in the police log says, 10 a.m., major looting became general. And in one shopping area three blocks long, thousands of Negroes stole everything they could carry and then burned what was left. What had been skirmishing before between police and hit-run Negro groups became a wholesale exercise in stealing and burning with evidence of organized efforts in the manufacture and use of Molotov cocktails. The police estimate was that 3,000 people filled this street. Walking through it then, remembering it now, that estimate seems conservative indeed. On one point, Chief Parker was firm throughout. He was determined to ask for the National Guard if his men found the Negro explosion too much to handle. Parker had agreed with Governor Brown a year before on machinery to do just that. But the guard had been called in a civil disorder only once in California history, an aircraft strike just before World War II. No one in high office wanted to be the man who turned bayonets against the people. At 10.50 a.m., however, Parker, declaring the situation out of control, asked for the National Guard. But it was 5 o'clock that Friday afternoon when Lieutenant Governor Glenn Anderson signed the proclamation. As the McCone Commission points out, Friday's delay in calling the guard proved costly in property damage and perhaps lives as well. The commission feels acting Governor Anderson hesitated when he should have acted. Further escalation of the riots possibly could have been avoided, says the commission, if a group of guardsmen available only a few miles away had been deployed, as they might have been, by mid-afternoon Friday. Then the guard came in. The first units mobilized and on their way at 7 p.m., the same time the first rioter was killed. A curfew was ordered, everyone off the streets by 8 p.m., and the brute force of 14,000 armed men finally broke the back of the riot. As the smoke lifted above Watts and the shooting died down, the soul-searching and blame-shifting began. Martin Luther King did not cut short his vacation in Puerto Rico, but went to Watts after the rioting and found the atmosphere less friendly than he might have expected. You all know my philosophy. You all know that I believe firmly in nonviolence. So maybe some of you don't quite agree with this. I want you to be willing to say that. And sure, we, we like to be nonviolent, but we up here in Los Angeles area were not turned that by the chief. Number two, in the fact that our Negro community leaders are the, where are they? You, they are not here and they are not coming down because, to me, all right, that's right, they are selling us again and we're tired of being sold as slaves. Don't burn, but smile, smile. Wait a minute. Oh, we want a job. We get jobs, we don't bother nobody. We don't get no jobs, we'll tap Los Angeles, period. What about, what you think, uh, brother, about the police? 
situation, do you? Police? The police will burn him up, too. Governor Brown, hurrying back from Greece and heeding, perhaps, the urging of King and other Negro leaders, found the riot area far from tranquil and the residents eager for an official ear. What does your husband do? I don't have a husband. We're, we're separated. Oh, you are. So you're prison. all by yourself? You have to raise the four children by yes. yourself? And how much do you get from the uh, Aid to Needy Children program? Uh, $234 a month. And my house rents $80 a month. Are there any places to say we could get a job if we had a job if for I, it? If, if I could go to work, I'd be proud to go to work. And I, and, uh, and I and could make enough money to have somebody watch my baby. I'd love to go to work. You mean there were a lot of people they hungry? People have been hungry all the time. Like just two two or three days before this, all this happened, these people were start, just about starving. They're waiting for the first till they got their check. Right. They yes, need yes, that. You mean this was a continuing situation right. down yes, here? All the time. Well, I mean, can't uh, right. um, don't they get the money from oh, welfare? Right. I mean, we have the aid and needy children. They need program. jobs. They need jobs. That's what they need. But creation of jobs depended in some degree on settlement of the city dispute with the federal government over administration of the poverty program. City Councilman Gilbert Lindsay. One of the Negro officials notably absent during the riot hit hard at the poverty tangle. I am also ashamed that we, including I, squabbled and fought over the war and poverty program, which is almost scandalous. But Mayor Yorty denied that he or anyone else in Los Angeles had hung up the poverty program by playing politics. He blamed Washington. I have tried for months, as you know, to uh, end the senseless, senseless controversy. And so far as I know, this is the only large city uh, where the Office of Economic Opportunity actually used strong-arm tactics by cutting off our funds and publicizing the fact that unless we met their changing dictates, uh, that they would cut off the funds. And they have certainly helped to incite uh, people in the poverty area by these tactics. And in Washington, Sergeant Schreiber replied in kind. 523 cities, towns, and counties in every state of the Union have already organized effective local anti-poverty programs. Los Angeles, unfortunately, is the only major city in the United States which has failed to do this. Whoever was to blame, the political shuffling of the poverty program was only one factor. The larger causes of the Watts explosion we'll examine in just a moment. CBS reports Watts, riot or revolt continues. As the pickets marched and the tension in Watts continued, we asked Muslim leader John Shabazz if more violence is in prospect. I certainly believe that it will happen again unless uh, uh, some steps are taken to prevent it. And uh, the reason that I believe this and the reason this is voiced throughout the community and I have my ear to the ground in the community is that but what has changed? There has been nothing done. Every grievance that was had by the people who, uh, called, who, who started this thing or who uh, took part in it, there has been nothing done to solve it. The only thing that was done was that massive forces were brought in to suppress the actual overt action. But there has been nothing done to solve it. In an effort to find a solution, Governor Brown announced the formation of an eight-man commission to investigate fully the causes of the disaster. John McCone, former head of the Central Intelligence Agency, was named chairman. The committee hearings have not been public, but the principal witnesses are known, and so are some of their views. Chief of Police, William H. Parker. A great deal of the uh, courage that uh, these rioters possessed was based upon the continuous attacks by their civil rights organizations upon the police, and the constant harassment, police brutality, police brutality, police brutality and the attempt of the police to accommodate to the situation that gave them the sense that we have these people on the run now. Uh, we don't have to really fear the police very much because uh, they're uh, in a defensive position. Now, in addition to that, you have this, what I call, politically, or political pandering, where they're constantly trying to reach these groups for political balance of power by catering to their emotions. Uh, you're dislocated. You're abused because of your color. Your, your progenitors were oppressed. 
You haven't been given the share of materialistic things you're entitled to. And you're trying to convince them, well, you're not well off, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to raise you out of this position of post-slavery to a position of economic uh, affluence. And, of course, many of these people in our present system are not in a position to set into the economy and become affluent unless somebody just hands it to them. Actually, and I, many uh, Negro leaders agree with me that Los Angeles is the finest place in the world for the Negro because he has the greatest opportunity here on a broad basis uh, than he will anywhere else in the world. So you have this paradox where things are the best is where the, the worst riot occurred. And I think you have to go back to civil disobedience. You don't have to obey the law if you think it's unjust. In other words, uh, you say, well, a, a certain law is unjust because it's a Jim Crow law. On the other hand, is the law unjust because I want a pair of shoes and they're in that store and I haven't got the money to buy them, so I can steal them. In fact, uh, it was amazing that in that inquiry we had in the council, one of the councilmen said, well, why were these people shot? They were only stealing. You say. So this, uh, they, they rationalized this. So with the civil disobedience, which erodes respect for all law, and that's been proven in this nation by now, it better have been, or if if we haven't learned the lesson there, we never will. Do you think that what happened was simply a criminal manifestation of disrespect for law? Or do you see it as something related to the, the social and economic strivings of the Negro? I think all those factors are involved. I think that the, the most important recognition that we must give to this situation is that of the 600,000 Negroes, who reside in the metropolitan area of Los Angeles, that the Watts riot involved less than 1%. And it is a mistake to group all of these people together because they don't deserve it and it would be inaccurate. In creating the situation, where was the failure? On the part of the city, the county, the schools? This, uh, I think, is one of the difficulties in meeting this is that we're trying to find a failure other than the people themselves. And this is a very dangerous move because it, it serves to sort of sanctify their acts on the basis you did something because of something we failed to do. In the first place, a great number of those people came from areas in the country where they were much further dislocated, much more seriously dislocated than they are here. They came in and, and flooded a community that wasn't prepared to meet them, despite the fact that we got all this relief money going in there. We didn't ask these people to come here. And suddenly they want our total community to adjust itself to a, a small segment that has suddenly come in and taken over a section. I think this is unreasonable. No, I, I think that we are uh, almost sadistic in the way we're trying to punish ourselves over this thing without realizing what we have uh, destroyed is a sense of responsibility for our own actions. We have, a, we have developed a permissive materialistic society in where everybody is the victim of their environment and therefore they're not to be held responsible for anything and if you can continue to live in that society, good luck to you. Parker's anger is shared by many, perhaps most whites. His stand is supported by many of them, nearly 120,000 of whom have addressed letters and telegrams to him personally 99% favorable. Parker believes disrespect for the law imperils the nation. But, says the Negro community, who can respect law that is divorced from justice? Tom Newsom is an attorney in the civil rights movement. During this entire incident, we've heard constant references to respect for law and order. And more particularly, what they mean is respect for law enforcement. Now, to really understand the problems of these people, you'd have to understand what law enforcement has meant to them for a hundred years. And we're talking about the white man's law enforcement that's responsible for many of their parents being chased out of the South on one pretext or another. The white man's law enforcement that has resulted in no one being actually prosecuted and convicted for the murder of Medgar Evers the murder of the three civil rights workers and the murder of Mrs. Lueso. Under those conditions, you can understand that the people aren't going to be reverent about law enforcement and the men who enforce the law. Over and over, Negroes repeat the charge of police brutality. One who had pressed a number of brutality complaints and one of the most successful attorneys in Los Angeles is a Negro, Leo Branton. We asked him about the police claim that brutality charges are fully and fairly investigated. Well, in theory, there are avenues of complaint open. But there are no meaningful avenues uh, 
uh, to redress the grievances of these people. I've tried them all, and I can say to you that there is no question but that under the present machinery as it exists and as, as it is being operated today, a complaint of police brutality by any Negro citizen goes almost completely unheeded because the instances of attention that are given to these complaints uh, are laughable. Now, it's been said that uh, people can bring complaints to the police commission. And the police commission is uh, the boss of the police chief and the entire police department. Well, this isn't so. I don't think that people would be agitating for a independent police review board if the existing police commission carried out the functions that it was intended to carry out. In the first place, you make a complaint before the police commission. Who investigates it on behalf of the police commission? Police officers. To this repeated complaint of the Negro community, the McCone Report responded by recommending that the police commission be overhauled to strengthen its authority over the department. The report rejected the idea of a civilian review board, but did recommend creation of a new post of inspector general, free of routine duties, outside the regular channels of the department, to investigate citizen complaints of police mistreatment and report directly to the chief. The report recommends also a vastly expanded community relations program to close the admitted breach between Negroes and police. Robert Richardson was a messenger for the Los Angeles Times when the riot began. His accounts of the rioting got him a cub reporter's rating and a job as the Times' first Negro reporter. Let me clear up something for you. When we speak of police brutality, we don't necessarily mean officers beating people as, say, they would do in the South with... Uh, whips or cattle prods. We mean brutality to a man's dignity. We mean uh, the uh, derogatory terms that are used, uh, directed to a person. When a policeman can't tell a housewife from a prostitute, when you're walking down the street with your girl and a policeman comes along and has you stand against a wall with your feet apart and checks you out and calls down on you and asks you what you're doing out so late at night, you have to have an explanation for everything. This is what we mean by police brutality. People who have come out here from the South encounter another problem even more serious than uh, police brutality uh, and opp job opportunity and job discrimination and things like this. This is a problem of the, uh, the, middle, the resentment of the middle class Negro, of the poor Southerner who comes out here. The uh, middle class Negro believes that this, these people uh, lower their standards, bring down their educational standards and lower their, their uh, reflection as a race uh, completely. So there's one large vicious circle. The poor southern Negro is moving into this area. The middle class Negro is moving into a predominantly white neighborhood. And the whites in that neighborhood are moving farther out. In other words, it's going around and around and around. And where is it going to end? I really don't know. Lots, riot or revolt, with more findings of the McCone Commission, will continue after this message. CBS reports, Watts, Riot or Revolt, continues. Theirs, they say, is a different world about which white Americans have bothered to learn very little. Indeed, the first thorough study of Negroes and how they live in this country was completed only a few months ago. Our government, which conducts detailed surveys of everything from sugar beets in Colorado to social habits in Cambodia, had never before taken a close look at the 21 million Negroes of America. Daniel Moynihan, until this summer, Assistant Secretary of Labor, was in charge of the study and was staggered by it. Moynihan says the Negro family structure is collapsing, and we asked him the reasons. The first is, remember that American slavery was the worst slavery the world has ever known. We can't get that into our heads, because the standard of living of the slaves was high, perhaps. We don't think, we don't see how awful it was. We deprived them of the sacraments as Christians. We deprived them of the, any institutions of family life. We deprived them of any rights as human beings. There's a very long and complicated history, but we did. There's no other slavery like it in history. And there was no Negro family at all in, in the slave world. Secondly, segregation and the great humiliation of Jim Crow life was a, was a brutal assault on the 
personal integrity of the Negro male. I mean, he was the man who took the brunt of it. Thirdly, urbanization uh, poured into the cities. The, they don't forget the Negroes of our time, because they're Americans, we don't see them as emigrants. The Negroes in Watts were emigrants, just as my much as the Italians or Irish or whatever who poured into the cities in the 19th century. And it wasn't a very pretty sight in New York in 19, 1870 either, let me tell you. Uh, the families break up when they leave countrysides, rural peasant life, and sort of dump into slums. Fourthly, unemployment. We have had 35 years of disastrous unemployment and uh, for the Negro male. He has never gotten over the Depression. He had four fair years, fair to middling years in the Second World War and maybe a good year in the Korean War, and that's it. It's getting better just recently. But by and large, it's been going on beyond the imagining in the white world. I mean, rates of unemployment, you know, teenage unemployment in the uh, white world, in the Negro world today is almost 25%. Can you imagine that? That is a social crime. That's an outrage. There isn't a society in the world which will let 25% of teenagers go unemployed. Uh, about a quarter of Negro families are headed by women. Uh, the divorce rate is two and a half times what it is. And all the, the, these, the number of fatherless children keeps growing. Um, and all these things getting worse, not better, over recent years. Uh, it's not a, not a matter of a bad situation that doesn't improve, but rather a bad situation that worsens got to get that clear, it's getting worse. How'd you learn how to behave from your father and your mother and your older sisters, maybe, and the people around you? Well, supposing there is no father, or if he is a father, he doesn't work, um, where there is no education, where there's no, no sense of, of getting ahead, where children are just brought up without any of that support which a family gives it, then what do you end up with? You end up a cycle reproducing itself. A UCLA study published within the last two weeks examined the background of young Negroes arrested during the riots. It established the typical rioter as a 17-year-old boy, a school dropout from a fatherless home living on a total family income of $300 per month. One such walking statistic is this young man, whose cool world is kept that way by occasional bouts with liquor and with drugs. On the nights of the riot, revenge was an added ingredient. Although he denied to the police any part in the looting and rioting, he took me on a tour of some of the places he said he helped to burn, as casual as a stroll in the park. What this young man had to say reflected a common attitude among the youthful rioters. I threw the firebomb right in the front window, right in the front window. A friend of mine went in the store towards the back and threw a firebomb in the back, and the place went up in flames. But it was pretty well... Uh, emptied by the looters and so forth. There isn't much left, is there? There is. A, here's a burned up shirt and so forth that could have been gotten, could have been used. But um, most things were taken out before you burned. As much as we could possibly get, then we would decide to burn. And the cry in the streets was, burn, baby, burn. So Why would you burn out this kind of place? We decided to burn this store because we felt that this man hadn't been doing nothing but gaming on us anyway. When you say that this man was gaming you, jipping you, do you know that for a fact? This man and every other Jew up and down the street, other than in rummage sales owned by Negroes, do not have nothing in them. Why, why do you say over and over, uh, Jews around here? Do you feel that way about Jews? I will not only say Jews, it would be fair to say that I hate all whites, period, point blank. What else happened in this block? Well, after we had got what we had gotten out of these stores we wouldn't dispose of it, stashed it. And then we arrived back to get as much as we could possible. We decided to get this loan company up here, this pine shop where this white dog works at that gyps people. Matter of fact, he gypped me. I brought an eighty-two dollar radio that I had bought and hadn't had over two months and I bought it here and it was in excellent condition. He, he gave me seven dollars for it. He wanted to give me five. He gave me seven. Do you think that's why most people took part in the looting and the burning because of one grievance from some time in the past? Yes, from some grievance and some time in the past, regardless of whether it was relating from a pawn shop or going to a store or what have you. Someone in to get even, such as I, because I call myself getting even by going in this store and taking whatever I could take out of it. And I got some pretty wonderful things out of this place.
pretty wonderful thing. And I like to. And it was Sunday yes. when you were arrested, right near here? Yes. I was on my way to a friend of mine's house, and a police car circled this corner here, and uh, the officers got out of their cars and approached us at gunpoint and told us to put our hands up and immediately hit the fence like this. And at the time they lined us up, they held us at gunpoint continuously, and then this white police officer approached me and asked me, well, black nigga, when are you going to let us kill you? So I replied to him, uh, I'm not going to let you kill me because I'm no sniper or nothing. I'm not going to be out there doing any wrong, trying to, you know, put myself in a good position because I knew that these white people were mad that we were taking to the jailhouse. And I was, I asked them, what was I going to be booked on? And they couldn't tell me. They couldn't tell me. They didn't say nothing. All they did was rope me up for burglary and looting, and I was arrested in a residential area. As you can see right now here, there's no stores, anything. There's nothing but houses. How long were you in jail? I was in jail a month, a solid month. It could have been longer, but I had a little money, and which helped me get out. So you bailed out? I, I didn't bail out. I beat my case completely. I had it thrown out of court. All charges dismissed. Think it's going to happen again? Uh, yes, I do think it will happen again, but under a different situation. It will be uh, better organized this time, and it will probably be more or less a surprise attack. I feel that it will break out unless the white man himself changes. If he changes and shows some type of other response to the way that he treats us around here, there will not be any right, because these people around here are willing to accept anything good, anything good, anything negative and bad, they will respond to it, because this is what they've been taught around here from teenage on up. They've been in gangs, they're 28, 29 year old people who've been in gangs and have developed attitudes that they've developed behind the way that they've came up. And I feel definitely that this most likely and most probably will break out again. If this young man is the living product of the ravaged Negro family institution described by Daniel Moynihan, Stanley Sanders is evidence of what a strong family can produce. His father, Hayes Sanders, recently retired after 33 years as a city truck driver, raised his family in the Watts area. Stanley, his sister, and his brothers, one of whom was an Olympic heavyweight boxing champion, were born in this house. A Rhodes Scholar, the third Negro ever to be so honored, Stanley now is at Yale Law School, but he was home during the riots. What made the difference between you and between most of the other young men? I think the most important difference is in my own life uh, or the influences from my family and, and the special attention that I got in high school. Uh, in the Sanders family, we were always encouraged to go on to the university and we were always taught to compete uh, on any level with, with anybody. What is your feeling about the people who took part, particularly the young men? A lot of them must have been men you knew. Why did they do it, and what did they say about why they were doing it? Well, I think that the, my particular age group, uh, Negro, uh, male between the ages of, of 18 and 24, is probably the one most uh, distressed group in the United States of the country, certainly in the Watts area here in Los Angeles. Um, they are most likely to be unemployed, uh, in this particular area, uh, they're either high school dropouts uh, or high school graduates with, with very little uh, skills, very few skills. Um, and I think also uh, there's, there's a, the business of, of, uh, of South Vietnam and how this affects the draft and, and, and economic means. Um, I think all these combine, uh, combine to uh, to uh, produce a, a, a frustration on the part of the young men uh, in this particular area of the city. The thinking of the entire nation must be changed as the goals of the Negro community move from liberty to equality, says Daniel Moynihan. No group in our society is satisfied if for many, many years, for generations, uh, the, the competitions of life always l end up with them as the losers. Now, equality isn't a demand that everybody live the same. That uh, flat level of existence, that's not the thing at all. What is true is a demand that, given one group of people, that you distribute success and failure and distinction and anonymity and affluence and poverty about the same way it's distributed in other groups. 
We've got to get men to work. You can't, a man can't run his family if he doesn't have a job. Does it just, just start there? Is there any secret to that? I mean, do you have to have sociologists tell this country that? No. Uh, creating jobs for men is no secret about it. We know how to do it. We've just got to get it clear in our minds. Either we do do it, or we're going to spoil this beautiful country of ours. And that means spoiling those pretty white suburbs just as much as spoiling those, those nasty and ugly places like Watts. Moynihan speaks of the situation confronting our nation. The McCone Commission sought to answer questions about Watts. Was the riot planned? The Commission finds no facts to support that conclusion, nor any evidence of communist activity. Did police brutality play a part in the outbreak? Yes. Some real incidents and some imagined, says the Commission, are at the roots of the deep distrust between police and Negroes. Did Negro hooliganism and provocation play a role in the riots and in the mood that led to them? Yes, says the Commission, and the little organization which fed the flames was led by gangs of angry young Negroes. Was it a revolt, not just a riot? Yes, in the sense that it was a formless, hopeless striking out against current conditions in the community. And can it happen again? So serious and explosive is the situation, says the Commission, that unless it is checked, the August riots may be only a curtain raiser to what could blow up one day in the future. It is that very fact which accounts for the disappointment among some responsible Negro leaders. Dramatic proposals and immediate measures are needed, they feel, to calm those rioting Negroes for whom nobody spoke. Long-range plans to give job training to thousands of Negroes a crash program of schooling for Negro youngsters may guarantee the future, they say, but the need is desperate and the need is now. A crisis in our country, says the McCone Commission, and government alone cannot render a cure-all. Help from private employers, from labor unions, from Negroes themselves is essential in this emergency. We would conclude this report with these final lines from the Commission. What shall it avail our nation if we can place a man on the moon, but cannot cure the sickness in our cities. This is Bill Stout for CBS Reports in Los Angeles. Good night. CBS Reports has been brought to you by International Business Machines, IBM. CBS Reports, Watts, Riot or Revolt, has been filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News. Next Tuesday night, the CBS News Special Report, Where We Stand in Vietnam, an assessment of the impact of the mounting American commitment in Vietnam, combining the reporting and analysis of six key CBS News correspondents and the results of a special CBS News National Public Opinion Survey. That's Where We Stand in Vietnam, a CBS News special report, next Tuesday night at 10, 9 Central Time. Tonight on Q&A, Institute.